Good afternoon, everybody. We have uh, Daniel Spiewak here. He's a principal engineer for uh, Disney Streaming Services. Uh, and his talk today is uh, Journey to the Center of the JVM. We all know the JVM lets you write once and run anywhere. Uh, Daniel is going to share some experience as it relates to the veracity of that particular. Daniel? Thank you, Tom. You're Thank you. Yeah, the um, I definitely um, well, I think we'll we'll discover together. But um, I think it's it's fair to say that I don't really believe that statement. All right, let's um, make sure that the presentation is actually running. There we go. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm Daniel. Uh, I you know. I don't know, introductions are boring. Um, I, I work on a lot of inter interesting stuff. I work for Disney and we're hiring. Okay, plug over. Um, this is the story of the, uh, basically the most complicated bug that I've ever chased in my career. <laughs> um, I've, I've chased some pretty weird ones and uh, this definitely tops the list. And um, uh, there's a lot of prerequisite knowledge here. Um, there's a lot of code um, that we're gonna be kind of going over. All that code will be in Scala, but hopefully it's the knowledge is pretty cross applicable. Um, you know, to different JVM languages, especially, you know, Java. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll all kind of come away with an appreciation for some very obscure features of the JVM that are not particularly well documented. Um, some interesting features of uh, sort of, you know, operating systems and, uh, you know, hardware architectures. And uh, I don't know, hopefully it'll be, it'll be fun. So, uh, you know, let me know if you, you enjoy it. And, and definitely feel free to ask, you know, sort of whatever questions you like. Um, before I get started, I do want to give sort of special thanks here, um, particularly to Ross Hassan, um, who uh, sort of worked with me on this. Um, you know, he was the one who ultimately <laughs> isolated the bug and, uh, you know, was able to get a really nice reproduction for it. Um, it, 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 it did take a lot of iteration um, to get to this point. Um, and, and he was able to write it up in a way which was very clean and, um, you know, brought a pair of JVM experts into it who, who ultimately, you know, uh, found the solution to the problem. So none of this would have happened without him. We'd probably still be stuck on this. Um, so uh, background, right? Like what, what actually leads to this bug? Well, this bug happened within a framework called Cat's Effect. Um, so if you're not familiar with Cat's Effect, it's an asynchronous uh, programming framework uh, written in Scala um, for the JVM, right? For writing high performance asynchronous software on the JVM. And um, we were working on the new version of Cat's Effect, uh, which involves a construct called IO. And uh, an IO, um, is an object that represents a, an asynchronous program consisting of many steps. And a running IO is called a fiber. It's just like some terminology stuff, right? Now, things about fibers, right? So properties that the framework is providing to the users who are working through this level of abstraction, right? So fiber evaluation, um, it has to be very, very high performance, okay? So we're dealing with um, sort of the fundamental building blocks of programs. So, uh, you know, even very small deviations from the optimal performance are, are, are magnified by the fact that, you know, this particular line of code will be hit, you know, hundreds of billions of times in a particular runtime. Um, it has to be asynchronous, obviously. Um, you know, we don't we don't want to be blocking threads. That's kind of the whole point of this runtime. And it also has to be stack safe. You know, we don't want to we don't want people to be thinking about Stack Overflow exceptions. We want you to just write your code, and then it should work. And then um, fibers also provide this interesting property, which is much higher level than what you can get out of threads, which is that they're interruptible and resource safe. So threads very famously have interruption that doesn't really work the way that you think it does. Um, so nobody uses it mercifully. Um, fibers are interruptible and it does work the way that you think it does more or less. Um, and uh, it, it, there's resource safety constructs built around that so that you can prevent fibers from just sort of running away forever. And, things like that. This is important for our story, right? Like we want to be able to interrupt fibers from other fibers that are just sort of making the decision to cancel something. So here we go, diving into code. Um, this is a, a relatively simplified, but still pretty representative um, uh, version of the implementation of a fiber, okay? So we're only showing a couple of the different cases, but the idea here is that we're going to do some pattern matching on the IO. And if the IO is a pure, that just means it contains a single value that we lifted into the IO, then what we'll do is we will pop the continuation from the run loop or pop the continuation from the stack 
and um, you know, uh, call that continuation with the value that was suspended in us and then continue the run loop, like call recursively into run loop. Um, if it's a flat map, that means that's two sequential IO operations back to back. What we'll do is we'll push the function, which you know is sort of the second IO operation there onto the stack. And then we'll call the run loop on the thing that's in the middle. Um, and if it's an async, well, async is where we're capturing like this callback effect, right? So the register function here needs to take a callback that, that you know, the, what will be asynchronously invoked maybe by some other thread or like by some IO process or something like that. Um, that callback will be invoked when you know when it wants to resume the run loop and we need to suspend the fiber and like sort of give things give control back to the underlying jdm thread while this is happening okay so you kind of see in the code there um, that this is taking place so again like kind of going over this one at a time we've got a mutable stack of functions okay and we're going to pop from it to get continue and we push onto the stack in flat map and and in a couple other places where we have sort of continuations within the uh within the io structure um and then in the async case uh, whenever we're resumed by the, the sort of callback we we pop and we resume the run loop right this is why we move things over onto a stack so we have this flexibility to to sort of pop and resume independently um, and async suspends the run loop so you notice there is no recursive call to the run loop function here instead we just return unit which is sort of scala's void and um, and we stop we just give control back to the underlying jvm thread and then someday you know we'll come back to it so um, you'll notice wrapped around all of this is a giant if statement, right? And that giant if statement is checking whether or not we are canceled, right? So there's this var, which is, you know, var canceled equals false. And this is the check to determine whether or not we've been interrupted by some other fiber. If, the, if some other fiber interrupts us, they'll set cancel to true, basically. And um, this is kind of a cool check. It means that sort of each stage of the IO, each stage of the fiber when being evaluated um, has this nice check kind of interleaved within it. So it's a little bit like if you're, you know, writing some traditional thread management uh, software and you write a while loop and then with each iteration of the while loop, you check sort of a Boolean to see whether or not you should continue that loop. Um, that's kind of the idea that's going on here and we're just baking it into the runtime. So the cancel action basically looks like this. When another fiber wants to cancel us, um, you know, it just sets cancel to true. And that's, that's cool. However, this is a little suspicious. Okay. And as it turns out, this is the root of many, many, many problems. So visually, this is where things start to get weird. Okay. So imagine that we've got three fibers um, represented by the different colors here, red, blue, and green, and they're all running on three underlying JVM threads. You can have more fibers than you can have threads if you want to. Um, but in this case, you know, we just there's three fibers running at this moment, um, and uh, the blue fiber running on thread B is going to cancel the green fiber running on thread C. Okay, and so it it runs this cancel action, and this cancel action sets canceled to true. But there is a problem here, okay? There's a hidden danger here that if you're familiar with the JVM memory model, you're probably already thinking about, but it needs a little bit more setup before we get there. So before we talk about what this problem is, let's talk about hardware. And particularly, let's talk about the memory hierarchy. So when a process is running, um, there's a hierarchy of memory access built in within sort of the operating system and, and more importantly built in within the hardware, which attempts to make frequently accessed data faster to access. Right? This is a very intuitive idea, right? If you're sort of like reading and writing from a single variable a lot of times, you don't want that to be in a, in a very slow place to access, right? You want that to be as, as accessible and as, as easy to get at as possible. And it turns out that um, the uh, hardware is built to have many, many stages to this, right? So CPU registers are basically kind of the, the level zero stage, right? This is data that's actually like right on the CPU and we can get at it and perform operations on it and like work with it and we don't have to go anywhere. It's just right there, okay? So that's a CPU register. And then there's this L1 cache and an L2 cache and an L3 cache and then finally main memory as, as far as your memory layers and then really disk is like kind of the final layer of access, right? Like swap space, 
um, is, is kind of the last thing that you would get at. And each one of these caches is much bigger than the previous ones, right? Like an L2 cache is maybe like two megabytes, like four megabytes, something like that. Uh, you know, L3 cache is, is commensurately bigger than that. At, you know, CPU registers, you only have 64 of them. Um, so, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of these sorts of things that, you know, you see the hierarchy tearing out. And each layer is commensurately much more expensive than the previous one, usually by about an order of magnitude. So here are the rough numbers, okay? It varies a lot from, from hardware to hardware, but CPU registers, you can get at the contents of a register in about three nanoseconds. The L1, L1 cache takes about you know, four times that amount of time. Then you've got the L2, L3, you know, main memory, et cetera. I find it difficult to sort of contextualize these numbers. So like building out a little bit of a metaphor here, because it is important to understand this hierarchy. Um, really, it's important just when you're writing software, but it's especially important when you're thinking about what we're about to run into. So if a CPU register is one grain of rice, then the L1 cache accessing the L1 cache costs you four grains of rice. The L2 cache costs you 10 grains of rice. Once you get to the L3 cache and the L4 cache, we're, or sorry, main memory, we're, we're into bowls of rice. And then disk is like more of a swimming pool, right? <laughs> like it's, it's a lot of rice. Um, and so uh, this sets up this hierarchy and this sets up this process where the operating system and the hardware will conspire to aggressively cache variables in the highest possible level that they can. Especially if you're touching that variable a lot, the data that's in that variable will be pulled into the higher and faster layers. And the fastest and best is the register. However, there's a dark side here, which is that everything above the L3 cache and really kind of the halfway point of the L3 cache because a good chunk of the L3 cache uh, is only visible to a single CPU, okay? So once you're in these higher layers of the, of the caching hierarchy, um, if you're, you know, only one CPU can see changes to variables that exist within those higher levels. And remember that threads map to CPUs when they're actually executing. So like, this is kind of a significant thing, right? If you've got three running threads and, and you know, simultaneously really running at, at one point in time, more than three cores, you know, you, you might not necessarily see changes from one core on a different CPU if those changes are being stored in these higher read faster layers of the memory hierarchy, okay? So this is a great optimization. It's a, it's a wonderful thing that is done for us to handle the vast majority of common cases where you know a thread is accessing data that's local to that thread, but it doesn't work out so great when you have data that you need to share between threads, like in the case of cancellation. So here's a, a more simplified example, right? So here we wrote like a very simple thread that has this sort of var canceled false thing. And we just do a while loop on it. And then we sort of thread sleep for 10 milliseconds. And then we check canceled again. And like we finally print done. And then off in the main thread, we, we start the example thread and you know, we sleep and then we set cancel equals true. And um, on most hardware, this program will never terminate. Um, because, I mean, it's not a daemon thread, right? So like th this program will never actually kill off the thread because the example thread is caching the var canceled in a higher layer of the memory hierarchy. And in fact, in this case, it's probably actually in a register. Um, and so it will, will probably never see the write to victim.canceled that happens in the main thread. Now we fix this on the JVM by using the volatile modifier. Okay, what the volatile modifier does is indirectly, it forces the operating system kernel to push things into different layers of the caching hierarchy. Okay, it forces consistency guarantees around certain things. And in particular, those guarantees as of Java 1.5, which is now like a million years ago, um, are the following. Okay, so writing to a volatile variable forces a write barrier, which means that all writes on that thread prior to that point must be published on that variable, including the volatile itself. So the variable is kind of like a handle to its, its barrier, right? You can kind of think of it through that metaphor. Reading from a volatile forces a read barrier, which means that all writes that were published perhaps by other threads on that variable are now visible. Um, and it is very, 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 very slow, okay? Um, you don't normally think of volatiles as being slow when like 
you're working with sort of network IO and disk and things like that. But like when what you're working with are like fundamental CPU operations, volatiles are very expensive because they defeat this whole caching hierarchy. So you don't want to be using them carelessly, right? Like <laughs> they're really a very, very expensive thing for you to be just sort of sprinkling through your code speculatively. However, these semantics give us a little bit of wiggle room because the, 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 you'll notice that volatiles don't just publish their own state, right? They don't just publish their own right. They also, they, they, the wording on this is very important. It publishes all rights on the thread prior to that point. And when you're reading, all rights that were published from other threads are now visible on your thread. And that's actually something that gives us a little bit of space to work with. So here's a very, very minimal example, right? We've got three variables, two of which are volatile, and one of which, A, is not. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a pair of threads, okay? And thread one writes a new value to A and then writes to C. And thread two writes a new value to A and then writes to B. And what thread three is going to do here is it's going to read from C, okay? It reads C's state, and if it's true, it will print line A. And what will happen here is thread three sees the write that happened in thread one. Because what thread one did is it wrote to A, which is not volatile, and then it wrote to C, which published the write from A. So thread three should, assuming things sequence correctly, should see a value A equal one. Thread two wrote to A and then published to B, okay, which did publish the right, but only published it on variable B, which thread three is just ignoring. So thread three is not actually guaranteed to see that. And, and really in most cases, thread three is just gonna see the value from thread one, A equals one. Um, but this is kind of cool though, because thread three, assuming we sequence it after thread one is guaranteed to see that result A equal one, despite the fact that A is not volatile. So that gives us some power. It means that we have the ability to make a variable, in this case A, behave kind of like a volatile variable in terms of sharing its state across threads without paying all of the performance penalty of just marking it as volatile and calling it a day. Um, I tend to think of this phenomenon like a window. Okay, volatile variables are like a visibility window. They provide visibility into everything which came before it in the writing thread. And any other thread which has access to that same window can kind of look inside, right? Now, other windows can see different things, but as long as you're looking through the same window, you're going to see a consistent state. And this gives us the idea for a very powerful and very impactful optimization within the implementation of IO. So what we're doing here is we're going to take advantage of the fact that when we release access, release control of a thread um, during the evaluation of the async stage, we have to mark the fiber as suspended. So we mark the fiber as suspended. This is for various other bookkeeping reasons so that we know that like the fiber isn't being held by a thread. So some other thread can come and take it. And like there's various other things that are, this is important for. So we're going to use an atomic Boolean called suspended. And what atomic Boolean will do, we set it down at the bottom there in the interpretation of async right before we just return void and let the run loop terminate. Um, we set suspended to true which is basically saying, hey, look, we're not on a thread anymore. We're waiting for a callback. Someone may eventually wake us up. And when someone wakes us up inside of the register callback, we're going to compare and set you know, suspended back to false and resume the run loop. And if we weren't able to compare and set it, that means that someone else for some reason already resumed us, like for example, up and cancel. So the idea here is that a fiber can be suspended. And then if someone comes along and cancels it, while the fiber is like, waiting for a callback, that cancellation can still run immediately. And if the callback comes back while the cancellation is running, that callback sort of gets discarded because it lost the race. Now we already have to have this machinery. Otherwise we might have a situation where a fiber is running on multiple threads at the same time. Um, but the cool thing about this is atomic Boolean is a volatile, okay? And, and in fact, the Java doc for the Java util atomic package says exactly this, right? It says compare and set and all other read update operations such as get and increment have memory effects of both reading 
and writing volatile variables. And so that means that suspended is kind of our window into the state of canceled, which can be non-volatile. So canceled is non-volatile. Changes to canceled are published by the compare and swap on suspended, which we already had to do in order to make sure that fibers are sort of owned by single threads. Like when we ran cancel, we had to make sure we had to do that compare and set on suspended as that's, uh, you know, as the cancellation action was sequenced. And as I talked about, like when fibers resume after async, they first unsuspend. And in order to make sure that we don't like miss something, if we don't have like an asynchronous block or something like that, we'll force a read on suspended to like kind of peek through the window, publish any changes, things like that. But ultimately, most fibers are going to be hitting read barriers pretty frequently anyway. And so this means that we actually have a pretty robust and highly granular mechanism, right? We can we can write to canceled from some other thread. Um, and uh, that write doesn't pay any performance penalty of like, you know, sequencing the cancellation or like forcing things out of memory hierarchies or anything like that. It just kind of like, it's gonna sit there until we match up read barriers on the, on the you know, sort of receiving end of the cancellation, um, at which point we'll see it. And we've already paid the penalty of the read barrier. So everything is fine. And it's, it's a very, very, very high performance mechanism. This works great. I cannot even begin to describe how well this works on Intel x86. There's a problem here, which is that the world is beginning to shift away from this highly x86 dominated infrastructure to a world in which a lot more of our software is running on alternative architectures, and in particular ARM. Um, so uh, ARM is something that uh, obviously we see it in mobile devices and we've seen that for years. Um, we're, we're starting to see it in desktop computers um, and uh, we're also starting to see it on servers, right? With uh, AWS's Graviton and, and Graviton V2 architectures. And there are real differences between x86 and ARM um, that we kind of have to take into account here. So the big conceptual difference between x86 and ARM is CISC versus RISC, right? So complex versus reduced instruction set. ARM lacks a lot of high level instructions like compare and swap, right? Um, in fact, compare and swap on ARM has to be emulated using uh, other sort of lower level primitives, whereas x86 just has a compare and swap operation. Um, another common example of this is, is array copying, right? Like x86 has, you know, a CPU instruction that just does array copying, right? And that's, this is kind of par for the course for x86. It has a very large instruction set that can do a lot of very powerful things. ARM conversely has a smaller instruction set that is easier to optimize for power efficiency. This is precisely why it's used in mobile devices. Um, and, and this gives it a lot of flexibility um, and uh, gives implementers who are actually printing the silicon the ability to do um, more things with their implementation. Um, let's see here. Uh, this is decided to get confused. Now, um, x86 has very, very strict memory semantics. This is like a, 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 a very important point about x86. It's kind of an operating, uh, uh, an architecture that's designed to make things easier, especially for compiler authors and for language authors and ultimately for application authors, is that the memory semantics of x86 are very, very, very aggressive. So all memory barriers are full memory barriers, meaning that the example that we had from earlier, where we had variables A, B, and C, and we only wrote to, like, we only wrote to C, and like, we sort of only saw that. On x86, you actually see both rights because Every barrier just writes everything. Um, and most writes imply barriers, even sometimes writes that aren't on volatile variables. So this is a little dangerous because most of us still do our software development on x86, which means that when we write complex sort of memory stateful code and things like that, we are we're looking at our software through the lens of x86's memory semantics. Memory semantics, which might not be true on our target architecture if our target architecture is ARM or anything else that has weaker memory semantics. And this is exactly what Ed Komet was concerned about when he wrote this tweet. Um, there's a lot of desktop software out there, a lot of software just in general, which is to, assumes 
total store ordering, and a, a number of other memory uh, semantics that x86 implements. And software developers like us aren't even aware usually that we're making that assumption. So if you just sort of take your software and run it on ARM, suddenly things start breaking non-deterministically and you're trying to figure out what happened. And as it turns out, that is exactly what took place in Cat's Effect. So Vasil Veselov, um, who wrote the uh, work stealing pool for Cat's Effect, um, just on a whim one day, decided to try running our unit test suite on an AWS Graviton V1 instance. And he discovered that there was highly non-deterministic test failures on that instance, test failures that we had never seen on x86. Now, this very quickly conjured to mind for me the Ed Komet tweet, which was kind of my first introduction to ARM having different memory so store semantics in the first place. And um, that made me pretty suspicious that what we were seeing was something architecture specific. We were able to reproduce it on a four core Raspberry Pi. Um, and we found pretty early on that it was very, very sensitive to timing and even state of the virtualization, right? Running it at different times of day when uh, Amazon's virtual uh, scheduling and hypervisor layers were you know, at different peaks in, in their activity did seem to make a pretty significant difference in how many millions of iterations it required to actually see the bug. Um, and the bug in particular was that fiber cancellation sometimes resulted in deadlock. Um, basically both the canceled fiber and the canceling fiber would end up hung, which is a state which shouldn't ever be possible if the memory store semantics were you know, what the JVM was promising us, right? So it just, it really didn't make any sense. So to understand why this is confusing, right? Like, let's just look at this simplified diagram again. We've got the blue fiber canceling the green fiber. And the semantics of cat's effect are such that when one fiber asks another fiber to cancel, the calling fiber, right? The blue one in this case will wait for the canceled fiber to complete itself before it actually sort of comes back. Um, and uh, this gives you the ability to sort of back pressure finalizers and, and sort of other nice things like that. The, um, the problem that we were having here is that the, kind of the calling fiber, like the, the blue fiber would sort of initiate the cancellation. The green fiber would not run the cancellation because it thought the blue fiber was gonna run it and the blue fiber thought the green fiber was gonna run it. So they just both kind of got stuck waiting for each other in some sort of weird standoff. So again, canceler request cancellation to cancel. If the cancelee is currently running, wait for it to run, right? Wait for it to actually run the cancellation. If the cancelee is not running, the canceller takes over to run the finalizer. So like if the cancelee is like off suspended or something like that, it will, uh, you know, it'll, it'll, you know, it'll, it'll figure it out when it comes back and the, and the canceller, you know, takes over and, and makes sure that cancellation is run immediately. Um, and this coordination avoids running finalizers in parallel, right? So you don't want uh, you know, a resource release to be run at the same time that you've got something else in parallel still using that resource. So we, we want to make sure, again, this property at most one thread can own a fibers run loop. Um, and the race condition is at the moment when the cancelee suspends, right? So you, you hit an async block and you're suspending the thread at the same time that cancellation comes in, like that race condition right there. So in particular, it kind of looks like this. This is a sort of code written with cat's effect. Um, and the race condition is like, right what I'm circling right here. It's the situation where the cancelee is getting right up to that IO sleep, which is gonna suspend it for a hundred milliseconds and take it off the thread. And at the same time, the canceller is calling cancel on the cancelee. Like if that happens at the exact same moment, that's your race condition right there because there's kind of a, they have to atomically decide which fiber is going to own the run loop and run the finalizers. In terms of code, it looks like this. And this is actually not even the abbreviated code. This is like the full thing. And I kept the comments in because I think they're really, really helpful. Um, but basically this is the cancel action, right? So when the canceller is calling, this is the code that it's going to run. And, and, and basically it sets canceled to true, just like we thought. And then it tries to do this compare and set on suspended, which is basically saying, can I, the canceller, get the run loop from the cancelee. And if I can, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna you know, run the finalizers. And if I can't, then I'm gonna drop all the way down to the bottom, the else condition at the bottom, and I'll just wait for the cancelee to you know, finish its, its cancellation. Meanwhile, in another part of town, the cancelee who's about to suspend gets to this logic right here, this code, which calls compare and set 
on suspended to sort of set the fiber to set the fiber suspension to true. And then after it suspends, it does a double check on canceled because it should now see the result. You know, if, if it got canceled, like while it was suspending, double check on canceled, make sure, okay, no one canceled us while we were shutting down. If someone did cancel us while we were suspending, then get the run loop back, re-resume, and then run our own cancellation. Otherwise, you know, let it fall through. So this is kind of the situation, right? Like the goal is to make sure that if, if you know, if you get canceled, either the canceller or the cancelee is going to own the responsibility for making sure that cancellation happens. This is a lot of code. Let's distill it down even further. Okay. So here it is on CPU one, we have canceled and, and sort of suspended compare and set the, the left side is the canceller and CPU two, the right side is the cancelee. We're sort of setting compare and setting on suspended. And then we double check the cancellation. So in particular, these four memory locations. Okay. So all of these in sequence are the things that actually matter. So here is the race condition. Here is what we were observing happening. Step one, on CPU one, cancel this set to true. Step two, suspended is comparant and setted, and it is currently false. So the fiber is not suspended at this point in time. That means some other, some other thread owns the run loop, okay? So that means that we fall through to the else case on the left-hand side right-hand side. Suspended is set to true. So now, like if, if you reverse these, that doesn't happen anymore. But you know, now suspended is set to true. So canceled is true, and we should see that result. But we check it, and it looks like it's false. This completely blew my mind. Like, I stared at this for so long and I was like, this is, this is actually completely impossible because the Java doc for Java Util Atomic is very clear. Compare and set has the effect of reading and writing a volatile variable. So if it has the effect of reading and writing, then it should be a memory fence on that variable, which means that the right to canceled true in step one really needs to be visible in step four. And yet unambiguously we were seeing that in step four, canceled was sometimes being false. You know, we just weren't seeing the right from step one. It wasn't all the time, but sometimes. And this was just so bizarre, right? So we kind of went through the stages of grief, right? You know, there's a bug in my code, there's a bug in the JVM, there's a bug in the CPU. For a while, I was thinking there was a bug in Amazon's silicon, right? Like they built the Graviton architecture. So I was talking to some Graviton architects and things like that to try to trace this down. I was pulling strings in the industry to talk to people at like Intel and stuff. And finally, finally, it all comes back full circle um, to there's a bug in my code. So are you ready for it? The issue is here. And more particularly, the issue is right here. So this is the side where we write canceled to true, and then we do the compare and set on suspended. And remember in our, in our case where this is failing, suspended compare and set failed, right? So suspended was false coming into this code, which means that the compare and set fails and we fall through to the else case. And that's really, really significant. As we discover, if we go and look at the documentation for JDK9, because in JDK 9, there was introduced a new construct called var handle, which is meant to replace some of the things that people used to do with sun misc unsafe. Now, var handle has this really nice Java doc, which is basically the same as what we've always had on Java Util Atomic, except it has a little bit more specificity. And if we zoom in enhance, there's one word here, which is extremely relevant. And that word is if. The guarantees about the memory properties, memory consistency properties of compare and set are only guaranteed. They only hold if the compare and set succeeds. If the compare and set fails, it might mean something else. And this detail is so important. This is something which is documented here on var handle and not at all anywhere in the JDK 8 
documentation, not in the VM spec, not in the Java doc, nowhere is this talked about. So let's be more explicit about this. Compare and set has the effect of reading and writing a volatile unless it fails. And a failed cast is only guaranteed to read, not guaranteed to write. And as it turns out, an ARM without the large system extensions, it is just a read. It doesn't ever write. Totally undocumented. And even the documentation, as I showed you, the documentation is actually deceptive because it kind of lulls you into a false sense of security. But all of this means that our memory barrier, that compare and set on suspended, isn't guaranteed to publish the right to cancel. Sometimes that right will just not be published when the compare and set fails. And this actually is the origin of the bug. So again, right here, this is the code. If canceled is written to true on the left-hand side and then suspended, that compare and set fails. Well, that means on the right-hand side, we're gonna do the compare and set on suspended again. That does the read barrier for us, guaranteed. But because the left-hand side isn't guaranteed to hit a write barrier, we might not see the updated value for canceled. And there you have the bug. So, now that we found it, the question becomes, how do we fix it? Because remember, this is very, very performance sensitive code. Like the whole reason we're fiddling around with like internal details of the JVM's memory model and like, you know, fence semantics and things like that is because we're trying to eke out every possible nanosecond of performance. So what can we do that doesn't require doing something horrible? Like, you know, setting cancel to volatile or something like that, which would work, which would 100% fix this bug, but it would be really, really, really slow because it destroys the memory hierarchy. Well, the answer, the credit for the answer is due to Victor Klang. Victor Klang, if you're not aware, he's the, the sort of, uh, you know, chief architect and now, now deputy CTO of uh, Lightband. He's, you know, one of the original authors of Akka and the, sort of the future uh, abstraction within the Scala Standard Library. Um, and he spent most of his career working on these kinds of problems. So uh, he, he was definitely a good person to reach out to when we started seeing this. And he suggested making one very small change to this code. Ready? So here's the original code. Okay. And the change we're going to make is on the left hand side. Ready? Here it is. We're swapping compare and set for get and set. Now, when Victor first told me to do this, I was like, there is no way that works, right? Because in, in my mind, I'm like, well, semantically, like we're trying to acquire the fiber. We're trying to acquire the run loop if the fiber is suspended. So we have to do a check, right? There has to be this kind of compare check, like that has to be in there somewhere. We don't wanna change the value of suspended if it's not already suspended. But when I, and I had a long response actually written up to him telling him how wrong he was, but in the process of writing it up, I convinced myself that I was the one who was an error. So here's, here's the argument, right? So compare and set true, false versus get and set false. This is what we're comparing. If suspended is true, set the value to false and produce true. So that the conditional, you know, matches and you end up in the if branch. Well, compare and set compares and does the right returning true. Get and set always writes returning true, okay? But that's fine because, you know, compare and set is gonna be doing the right anyway, so they match up. If suspended is false, keep it false and return false. Well, compare and set compares and then does nothing, leaving the values false and returning false. Get and set unconditionally writes, which is item potent, because it's just writing false on top of false. And then it returns false. So in other words, these two instructions actually have the exact same effect, but as it turns out, they are subtly different from the perspective of memory semantics. So what we need here is we need a single extra write barrier on ARM. We don't need anything extra on x86 because x86 is already doing crazy things. So let's look at what's actually happening here. On x86, compare and set is a lock compare exchange instruction. Okay, That's the, the actual assembly instruction that's, that's happening under the, under the surface. Get and set is a lock exchange. 
So they're actually almost exactly the same intrinsic. And in fact, they behave almost identically. The only difference is that on ARM, we remove a branching point. So we remove this sort of branch conditional in ARM without large system extensions. Um, and uh, removing that conditional means that the pipelining actually behaves better. So it's, it's kind of actually crazy, right? Like this is, this is a change that doesn't do anything for x86, but it actually improves performance on ARM and it gets us the correctness that we want. I, I was just kind of blown away. Like it was basically like, you know, a, a 10 character Delta or something like that for this bug that was literally the craziest of my entire career. So it's a one line fix for this really crazy tale of woe that improves performance and correctness at the same time. It's not often that those two things align, but here they happen to. The JDK really needs better documentation on that stuff. Yes, I know JDK 8 is a very old VM. It's what most people are using, okay? Like it's it's the subset of the, the JDK that like for the most part, library authors have to restrict themselves to. This isn't documented anywhere. And this is really, really fundamental stuff. Even more fundamentally than that though, as software developers, we need to remember that x86 can mask bugs. You may, your code may work all the time when you run it in unit tests and when you're working on it on your laptop or you know on your servers or things like that. But if you swap it to a different architecture, like say swapping your, your AWS uh, EC2 instances from you know, the standard x86 ones to the AWS Graviton instances they've been pushing. Or say, if you maybe, I don't know, bought the new shiny like Apple hardware that is, happens to be built on ARM, you need to think about this stuff because x86 and ARM do have different semantics and those semantics leak up through the abstraction layers into the layers that we can see and we have to care about, particularly related to this sort of concurrency coordination stuff. So be aware of this, like really, really be aware of this because a lot of applications can and will hit this. Final conclusion, Victor Klang is really impressively clever because he, he figured this out with comparatively little context um, and, and suggested that one line fix, which was just like, and this is what's in Cat's Effect 3 today. Um, so very, very, very impressive work. Kudos to him, kudos to Ross, um, and, and really special thanks to, to all of the sort of core JVM developers uh, from, uh, from Red Hat and, uh, and from Amazon who uh, sort of pitched in and, and suggested the error of our ways. Um, very much gratitude. That's the end of my talk. Um, I, I hope you enjoyed my tale of woe. Um, I am here to answer questions to your heart's content. I think we actually even have like a little bit of time to spare. Go over here to Slack and see what's going on here. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna scroll back up a little bit here. So Martin Snyder asked uh, some people in the audience were initially saying just slap volatile and canceled. Um, what would be the impact of doing that instead of the fix you ended up with? Um, that's a great question, um, and and really the answer is it would make things much slower. Um, the exact magnitude to which that makes things slower uh, depends a lot on your application. Um, if you have relatively large memory sets that you're working with on a given fiber, then every time you do that cancel check, um, it's going to result in sort of paging out that memory. Um, and that's, that's quite expensive. Um, and if you're doing a lot of cancellation, it, it can be a problem. Um, but it, it really varies. The thing is, because Cat's Effect is this generic library, we don't want to make assumptions about the sorts of applications that people are writing. Um, so we didn't want to put volatile on there if we could avoid it. Like we want to keep the memory barriers as light as possible because in practice that seems to have a, a pretty substantial impact uh, on a lot of real world applications. Uh, let's see here, more questions. Um, well, wow, there was some really good discussion around uh, canceled being volatile. Um, 10 character delta that improved performance. Yep. Yep. Self-licking ice cream cone, pretty much. It, it was pretty, it was pretty impressive. Some more people are typing here. So we'll, we'll let that come through. Thank you all. I very much appreciate it. Certainly the experience of going through this was, was pretty heartbreaking. <laughs> like it's, 
you know, I've been, I've been doing software development for a very long time and you, you just never actually get past that moment where like you hit the bug and you're sort of churning against it. And eventually you get to this point where you're just like, why am I even in this industry if I'm going to be so stupid, right? Like you just, you, you like you're always going to have that. It never goes away. Um, Daniel asked, uh, any difference between Scala's volatile and Java volatile? No, there is no difference. Um, Scala simply represents it as this sort of at volatile annotation. It's just a syntax thing. Um, it is actually the same thing as Java's volatile. And if you sort of deconstruct the bytecode, you'll, you'll see that as well. Um, this is actually something that I like quite a lot about Scala is that it, it does give you uh, this kind of control over uh, how the bytecode works. And it, it, it at the end of the day, you can kind of look through the magic abstraction layers and, and really fiddle with things. Um, Scala is in a nice sort of happy medium where it gives you these very high level, like powerful abstract capabilities, like what you see in cats and cats effect. Um, but it also gives you these very low level, like, oh, at volatile or, you know, strict FP or things like that, where, um, you know, you can get the semantics that you need um, in those specialized sort of performance or, or correctness cases. Um, Martin, what, what was your worst bug experience prior to this short version? Um, oh boy. Okay, so worst prior to this um, is, is a good cautionary tale in and of itself. Um, so I was writing an application um, that was sort of pervasively implemented in future. This was way back, it was Akka's future at the time before it was in the standard library. And we were seeing an issue sometimes where once the application had been running in production for like seven, eight hours, something like that, the, the runtime had been live for about that amount of time. We started seeing bugs where the, uh, even the, va the, the values returned from floating point arithmetic were wrong. And I don't mean wrong like, oh, there was some sort of IEEE rounding error that was weird. I mean, literally two plus three was equaling seven or something like that. And it was really, really weird. Like we couldn't figure it out at all. Like it was just like the JVM was actually behaving wrong, like completely out of spec. And like I was working with a really, really good team at the time. And we started suspecting that there was some sort of error that we weren't catching, especially because it was sort of future, right? So like your stack, you know, if, if exceptions happen, they'll sort of blow up the thread and you might not necessarily see it. So we were just crawling through logs and crawling through logs and crawling through logs. We couldn't find anything. And after a couple of weeks of this, uh, of just literally like floating point arithmetic isn't working, right? Like that's that's the, the level of insanity we were at. Um, we finally got the application to fail and we got a stack trace. And the stack trace was a stack overflow error, which we thought was very odd because, you know, it's like stack overflow errors are, are you know, they're errors. They do take down threads, but they're like, they're never going to like blow up your JVM. It's not like a link error or an out of memory error where like the JVM spec actually says that after certain out of memory errors are thrown, the JVM can be in a completely undefined state. So this is why you don't want to catch them. Um, well, as it turned out, long story short, we were catching the out of memory error. It was actually Akka's future implementation written by Victor Klang. Um, that was catching the out of memory error and um, swallowing it and then trying to throw a new stack trace. But in the process of constructing the stack trace, it was running out of stack. So that threw a stack overflow error from the exception handler, which we eventually were able to piece back together to, it was an out of memory error. Um, so it, it was really bad, but this is actually why, if you know about the Scala util non-fatal thing, it comes from this bug investigation. Like, <laughs> like Victor, Victor kind of got involved in this and was, was kind of mind blown that we saw this, but moral of the story, don't catch out of memory errors. Like your, your JVM will be very, very strange. Like just, just let it die. It's for the best, I promise. Um, Yes, all my worst issues are laid at Victor's doorsteps. Basically, my career is his fault. Like, I'm, I'm just going to blame him for that. Um, one, more, one more question from Phylum. Um, can cancel not be volatile or atomic Boolean, but something that doesn't use volatile in the hood, but provides atomic guarantees like reference array? So that's a great question. The problem with volatile is not volatile itself, but rather the memory fences that it implies. So when it gets compiled down to assembly code, the memory fences that get inserted 
into the runtime evaluation flow, that's what's really expensive, particularly on x86, where it's like, you know, fencing everything. Um, so uh, atomic Boolean still has those memory fences, because again, it has the effect of reading and writing a volatile field. So, um, you know, the, the expensive part of volatile is still present in atomic Boolean, unfortunately, and you're not really going to get a performance increase of this, this form by, by skipping it. Um, it. It would be nice. It would be really, really, really nice if we could do that. But uh, unfortunately, we can't get away from that problem. Um, Michael asks, uh, what was the timeline to discover the fix for the uh, compare and set to the get and set change? Uh, total timeline, I'd have to look back over the history. I think it took us about two or three weeks. Um, I think about three weeks uh, of minimization. Um, basically did a lot of work trying to figure some stuff out. I wasted a lot of time trying to get QEMU um, up and running uh, on my laptop, which I did. Um, and I was trying to, QEMU is usually used to emulate like the Nintendo DS or something like that, right? Um, but I was trying to run Debian uh, on top of QEMU on top of my laptop, which is running x86 to see if I could like just reproduce the bug in a more controlled environment than, than AWS. Um, for the record, uh, I did manage to get the JVM running on Debian on QEMU on my laptop, but uh, QEMU does not emulate the uh, uh, ARM memory store semantics. It just inherits memory store semantics from x86. So that was a dead end that took me like four days. Um, eventually I just got an EC2 instance um, running Graviton and uh, you know installed the JVM and like sort of you know ran things through that. And that was what was our primary mechanism. But it was really not until Ross um, sat down and really minimized the issue. It, it took him about six hours of hacking overnight to like, he sort of started from the big, like, oh, our entire unit test suite is failing. And he narrowed it down to something that was, I think about 75, 80 lines of Java that failed. You would usually have to run it a couple of times, but at once every few hundred million iterations, we would get a failure out of his reproduction. And that was good enough that we could work with it. But yeah, his, his all night hacking sessions are, are quite legendary. Great questions, really, really great questions. Bilem has a question about, did I miss, did I miss anything? Um, so you should cancel be volatile. Um, I answered the bit about atomic Boolean, I think. Uh, did I miss anything else from Phylum? Oh, there we go. Cool. See uh, more people are typing here. It's always the, the interesting sort of virtual interaction model, um, you know, sort of watching the Slack chat scroll by and, and, and trying to sort of make everybody feel involved. It's a very different uh, conference experience. I kind of like it in some ways. Um, I, I certainly like how you don't have to travel to the conference to, to get this experience. You can just, um, it's, it's much easier and more accessible to people, I think. What's my opinion about Go or other non-JVM options for performance hungry apps? This is an awesome question. Mm. All right. Um, performance is not a one size fits all. Um, you really need to look at what are the things uh, about your application that are slow? Um, what are the things that might be issues that you need to optimize or improve? Um, something that the JVM is very, very good at, which is often overlooked, is memory management. Um, I, I, I realize that's somewhat ironic given the topic of my talk, but um, memory management and in particular garbage collection is something that the JVM is incredibly good at, very, very, very high performance. And so when you're writing microservices, which have typical microservice patterns of like accepting, you know, network requests and then, you know, probably decoding some JSON and like allocating some objects for that JSON, do some transformation, then render it back as JSON and send it somewhere else. This is like what most stuff is, right? That type of thing pushes a lot of memory pressure um, and the uh, performance bound on it in the hot path is really more than network IO. Um, so what you want is you want stable throughput um, with, you know, sort of bounding by the network IO. The JVM is 
unambiguously and objectively the best runtime in existence for that problem. It beats you know, the CLR, it beats uh, Go, it beats C++, it beats V8. Like the JVM simply destroys that scenario for a whole bunch of reasons. So when you're looking at high performance stuff, if your sort of problem space falls into that category of thing, then you shouldn't even be thinking about Go or C++ or something like that, because the thing that you really need to optimize is something that JVM is already optimizing for you better than you could do for yourself. Um, and this, this is the JVM's niche. It, it probably always will be the JVM's niche. And it's a really potent one because there's a lot of microservices out there. With that said, there are cases where the JVM's performance is not appropriate. Um, you know, and then the JVM's performance profile isn't a good fit. Mobile stuff is a really good example of this. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to run the JVM on my iPhone, for example, or my watch. Um, but there are better server-side examples as well. Um, High-performance numeric computing. Um, if you're doing something with machine learning, for example, like say you're operationalizing a model in the critical path, which is something that people do sometimes do, you're going to be bounded not so much by network I.O. or by memory management, but actually bounded by the performance of your numeric primitives, because you're going to be doing a lot of matrix multiplication and stuff. And um, and this, this shows up as a problem in two areas. Number one, if you're running on hardware and you're doing something with CUDA or like sort of OpenCL or something like that, um, where you're interacting with the GPU, the JVM is going to be a very painful experience to do that. You're probably going to be crossing the JNI boundary a lot to make that happen, um, which is very expensive. But even if you're doing a more containerized deployment where you're still doing your fundamental numeric processing on the CPU, processor architectures, even through virtualized environments, have much more, uh, uh, much faster um, numeric operations than what you have access to in the JVM. Things like unsigned uh, integers and you know, uh, vectorized operations and things like that are all things that the JVM doesn't really give you access to, but you do have access to them in native languages such as C++, Go, or Rust. And when I'm working on problems which fall into that category, I generally use Rust. Um, Go is an option, and Go is definitely the other sort of elephant in the room in this space because no one wants to use C++. I think the problem I have with Go is it's just really verbose and kind of painful um, to work with, whereas Rust is actually like a really well-designed language that has a lot of abstraction power um, and a lot of safety built into it. Um, while still giving me access to all the really low level primitives that I, I need to have access to. It's a long winded answer to your question, but it's a really good question, like super, super good. Um, have I ever talked to Brian Getz about this one? I haven't. Um, and yet he, he and I are both actually uh, in the, the speaker lineup this year, but I'm, I'm sure he would be um, quite bemused to see this. I'm sure he would see the problem right away with the compare and set, because um, this is right up his alley. Uh, but uh, I, I think at the very least, it's it's a good war story, <laughs> um, and uh, hopefully something that uh, uh, he can you know laugh about at, at, at you know and at various conference docs or bars in the future. <laughs> Funny, I talk about go being awkward. Yeah, I, I mean, awkward is a subjective thing. Um, I do think that go tends to produce a lot of verbosity. It's a very, very very verbose uh, language. Um, even with the addition of generics, it's it's still going to be pretty awkward. Um, there's just not a lot of abstractive power in the language itself by design. Like they didn't want it to have abstractive power. So, um, you know, uh, I work on a code base that has uh, a lot of Go in production. Um, it's certainly not the majority of our code, but there's there's some parts of the pipeline that that hit it. And the information density of that code is really, really, really sparse like really, really, I mean, millions of lines for things that would have been thousands of lines in Scala. Um, and that's not an exaggeration. <laughs> so uh, Rust doesn't have that problem. And and Rust has a lot of other nice things like, you know, sort of memory linearity and like type classes and other other things that just make Rust a very pleasant uh, language to work in. So um, again, subjective opinion, but like if I'm working on those types of things where I need the native access, um, I, Rust, is, Rust is definitely my go-to. Okay, Daniel, I'm going to cut in. We got to flip over now. Thank you very much. This is really interesting. I really enjoyed it. Take care of yourself. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, all. I appreciate it.